So, <laughs> okay, good, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this session on managing a splash for the SDGs and climate goals. For those of you who've managed to get into the room, congratulations, I think you deserve a round of applause. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a tight, uh, tight venue, um, and so uh, we've got a kind of a cozy room today. Uh, we're actually gonna start, um, this is a panel session essentially, but we're gonna start with a short film, um, which has been produced by C4, um, which hopefully, if technology allows, we can start. Earth. So please indulge us for planet. three or four minutes. The sun heats things up and water vapour evaporates into the atmosphere from Earth's land and oceans. Circulated by winds, this moisture flows around the world. Rainfall completes the water cycle and shows where the heat ends up. Most climate models assume that atmospheric moisture production and transport mainly responds to ocean temperatures and global wind circulation patterns and less in a predictable way to land surfaces. But Earth is also the green planet. Seen from space, rainforests feel daily pulses of moisture into the Earth's atmosphere as they transpire during the day. These pulses of moisture followed by rain are clearly visible on this radar animated map of rainfall created by NASA. This water vapour either falls back locally or becomes transported by winds across large distances, bringing rainwater in downwind, often distant locations, even in another country. On this animation, the atmospheric moisture created over the Brazilian Amazon is transported to Argentina and into the Atlantic Ocean. So forests in one country can generate rainfall in another. Getting the global picture and being able to track rainfall from one place to another across the planet teaches us how forests influence the water cycle, how they help replenish our reservoirs and how transboundary regulations may be required. The biotic pump theory provides a novel scientific basis for the huge streams of water vapour in the sky. According to the theory, forests are active low pressure regions. They suck in moisture from the ocean for long distances into the interior of continents and sustain rainfall far within. Reliable rainfall in the interior of continents such as Africa and South America may therefore be dependent on maintaining relatively intact and continuous forest cover all the way from the coast. Regreening deserts may reactivate the pump, change wind patterns and bring rainfall into the desert interior. Equally, losing our forests could deactivate the pump and turn lush green continents into deserts. When we lose forests, transpiration declines. We might expect a weakening of rainfall in downwind locations and less rain at the interior of continents. This colourful view from a NASA climate model reveals the global impact of smoke from fires. The yellow mixture of organic and black carbon from fires spreads as haze across the planet. Black carbon, or soot, impacts air quality and human health, while black and organic carbon both contribute to climate change. Smoke producing fires, such as peat burning over Indonesia and deforestation fires in the Amazon, further reduces rainfall, recent studies reveal. Drought triggers fire, but fire can further suppress rain by disrupting 
clouds conviction. Understanding the role of forests and deforestation on local, regional and global precipitations is crucial. We know there's a link, but we do not understand it. The research is complex and in its infancy. The world needs to know these planetary works to manage better the world's reservoirs of fresh water and how these reservoirs might become depleted without forests. Okay, thank you. So I think that nicely sets the scene on some of the issues related to forests and water. And at this stage, I'm going to hand over to my co-moderator, Lotte Samuelson from SIWI, who's going to take us to the next stage. Thank you, Terry. Uh, coming from the Water Society, it's very, uh, we're very happy to be here today. I think this uh, film showed beautifully how interconnected the forests and the water is. Uh, and for my sake, I started working at CIVI with a, a Swedish group of foresters from different institutions and authorities and uh, industries. And we started a dialogue on the importance of actually preserving and managing sustainably the forests for the sake of water. And in this process, we got in contact with C4, and C4 came to one of our seminars and, and further discussion and expanded it to discuss not only forests, but also the forest landscapes. And we came into the landscape approach. And one thing led to another. So uh, in August this year, at the yearly World Water Week, uh, we had a landscapes <coughs> seminar uh, with the water professionals, discussing the importance of actually preserving and, and sustainably manage the forests in the landscape with the water professionals. And we had a very good go ahead on the importance of this dialogue. And here we are today. So now we're with the, the landscapes professionals uh, bringing the water into to the landscape approaches. So it's actually a chain of happenings that makes us sit here today. And today we're very excited to continue the dialogue with you, all of you in the audience, and also with the help of an eminent panel, which you can see on the screen, that will push us ahead in our thinking. But first of all, I'm very proud and honored to introduce uh, Elisabeth Bakteman, who is uh, State Secretary at the Swedish Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation. And uh, we are so happy that you have agreed to make a keynote speech. And we are very curious to hear about what you want to say. Elisabeth, please. Thank you, Lotta, and hello, everybody. I'm very happy and excited that there are so many people here in order to, to listen to me and listen to the panels, panelists and have a, a, a fruitful discussion. Uh, first of all, I would really like to, to thank C4 and the Swedish Water House at the Stockholm International Water Institute for, for actually inviting me here to this event, making a splash for SDGs and climate goals. And I will for sure try to make more than a splash. Uh, I would like to start by saying that the Swedish government uh, would like to make a big standing waves for SDGs and climate goals around the world. This is the first time that I'm participating at the Landscape Forum. And I'm struck by the enthusiasm and the conviction that people express uh, towards the landscape approach. And the positive energy is indeed welcome and needed. As we come together here in Paris, just weeks after the dreadful terrorist attacks, to take urgent action on climate change, we need more than ever to stand up for democratic values and peaceful transformative change. After having spent the afternoon here, I wonder if we are not witnessing a global reformation on land. The word reformation comes from the Latin word reformo, meaning to give new form or renew. The SDGs are indeed a renewed global commitment to sustainable development. 
while the new development agenda and SDGs, uh, with the new development agenda and SDGs, natural resources, such as forest and water, play a much greater role than with the previous agenda and the MDGs. Forests and waters are now recognized, both with specific targets, but are also seen as integral part of achieving many other goals and targets. For example, by 2030, we want to ensure that all men and women have equal rights uh, to economic resources. And this includes ownership and control over land and natural resources, including forest and water resources. If you by 2030 want to achieve sustainable consumption and production patterns, then you need, sustainable, you need to sustainably manage and efficiently use natural resources, including forests and water. With the SDGs, we also see the whole world unite in one single universal agenda. We have one planet, and it's our shared responsibility to ensure that it can support the needs of the present and future generations. As Juan Rockström, Executive Director of Stockholm Resilience Center said earlier today, we need to become planetary stewards. With the SDGs, all countries and stakeholders are acting in collaboration to promote the 2030 development agenda. I'm particularly happy to see that the SDGs make an explicit link between forests and water in target 6.6. If you fly over Sweden on a clear summer day, you will see green and blue. We are really blessed with rich forest and plentiful water resources. We have a long connection between the, these two ecosystems and how they interact and provide products and services that the wealth of our country is built upon. <coughs> we have long experiences and knowledge of restoration and sustainable management of forest and water resources, as well as technology and innovative solutions. And we are happy to share this with the world. And we are also happy to learn from others too. I participated in World Forestry Co Congress in Durban just a few months ago, and there thousands of people came together to discuss the challenges in the world, in the forest sector and in the world, <laughs> obviously. Uh, forests and water are now recognized <coughs> both, sorry, uh, increasingly the dialogue involves other sectors such as water and energy, and also increasingly new voices are being heard such as the millions of smallholders and young people that struggle to make a living from forests and natural resources. This broader recognition of natural resources for livelihoods and the interconnectedness of other sectors marks a significant shift from the past. And this is a sharp contrast to the MG MDGs that only saw forests and water as subsets of the environmental goal. This more people-centered development in which many different sectors intersect is being translated into practical application at the landscape level. <coughs> the dialogue on this is of course at the center of this landscape forum. While I welcome the landscape approach, I still believe that in particular, at the national level, there is a lot of room to give, to give new form or to renew our way of thinking of sectoral uh, approaches too. Sweden is for the moment in the middle of giving new form to sectoral policies for forests, food and energy. Uh, we are currently developing national forest program and a national strategy for compet competitive food production and also a long-term agenda for bioeconomy. <coughs> the Swedish government has earlier today, during the action day under the Lima Paris action agenda, made a commitment to become one of the world's first fossil-free welfare states. And this will only happen if we make the transition to a bioeconomy. 
And we are already well on our way. Today, bioenergy at 32% is the biggest source of energy in Sweden, bigger than nuclear power and also bigger than oil. In the Swedish context, forests make climate sense as a substitution of fossil fuel or fossil materials that require high energy input. Sustainable forest management also contributes to maintaining a high level of net forest sink, as well as other ecosystem services, including clean water. For every tree we cut down, we plant at least two, two new ones. When it comes to adaptation to climate change, trees and forests play an important role too. They moderate water budgets and reduce erosions and runoff. This function will be increasingly important as extreme water-related weather events, such as flood, flood and drafts, changes in precipitation patterns and are expected to increase due to climate change. Dear friends, we live in a turbulent world. In 2015, many global processes relevant to forests and water are at the crossroads, such as the SDGs and the new climate agreement. The solutions may be find, found in many places within the United Nations, other international organizations, regional platforms, our countries, and through research and private sector initiatives, but also in our everyday life in landscapes across the world. <coughs> Together, these different levels interconnect and bring the big standing way of transformative change. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Secretary Bachterman. Uh, the next stage is we'd like to call the, the panel up uh, to, the, to the stand. I notice we have seven panelists and six chairs. <laughs> so uh, this isn't a t an attempt at musical chairs at all. We need to find another chair, if possible. <laughs> Given the paucity and scarcity of chairs uh, here, it, um, but anybody uh, if anybody has a spare chair back there or anywhere. <laughs> but that's perfect, thank you. So first up, let me call... Um, uh, Tony Holmgren, who is the Siri Executive Director, um, and uh, followed by uh, Dr. Peter Holmgren, uh, Director General of C4, who's also my boss. Hi, boss. <laughs> um, Marie Teresa uh, Vergas from the uh, Fundación Nat Natura Bolivia, uh, working with grassroots agencies on water issues. Um, Evan Gerwitz from SIAT, another CGIR center, uh, working on water ecosystem services and other issues. Uh, Tui Shortland from uh, New Zealand, working on uh, indigenous issues related to water management. Anders Malmö, who's the executive director of uh, the Swedish um, Agriculture University uh, Global Program. And finally, Christine Danica from South Pole, who uh, is, was mentioned earlier, is, is responsible for offsetting our carbon for this particular meeting. So welcome, all of you. So the first, the first part of this, this uh, session will be um, both Lotta and I asking questions, directed questions to, to each of the panelists. Um, and then we're going to throw it out to the audience for some, some Q&A uh, and then a short summary at the end. Um, a practical thing. In the, in the panel, you will need to grab and share the, the mics. Yeah. You will also need one. I'm not. Sorry? You will also need one for your I questions. Will. So the, so the first question, I, let me pose to, to Peter Holmgren. Um, Peter, I mean, from the plenary, uh, there's a long discussion about how much um, the landscape approach has been put on the global agenda, and um, C4 has been very much at the, the pinnacle of that C4 and partners. From a, landscape, from a forestry perspective, what's the, what's the relevance of the landscape approach for water management? Where do you see future initiatives in terms of research and development? Well, first, first of all, I think it's great that what has been said already, that we are bringing together what used to be more isolated disciplines and sectors, and, and we can discuss these things together. 
I thought the, the video was interesting in, in a few different ways, and I'll use that as an example of what might not be the most uh, interesting way forward, because uh, David was also working for C4. He said something towards the end that, oh, we need to understand this better so we can manage the planet or something like that. And I, that worries me a bit because I don't, I don't think this is about managing the planet. I mm. think it's about figuring out uh, local solutions that make sense um, and, and, and not uh, starting to engineer the rain patterns over the Amazon. I think that that's perhaps not where we want to go, but I'll leave it hanging there for the moment. Okay, let me ask uh, uh, Tony. Um, from the water perspective, where do you see the role of, of the landscape approach and, and forests? Uh, let me share some reflections. Start with one of the first splash on SDGs. As we all know, we all know that there are 17 SDGs decided upon by the General Assembly on 25th of September. And as I, I mean, we should not end up in 17 silos. They are all interconnected, and we see water as a great connector in between the SDGs. So that is number one. Number two as we're now discussing climate here in Paris, and uh, we are together with a number of organizations having a campaign, climate is water, because climate change to a large extent manifests itself either too much water floods or too little water droughts, and that is given. And finally, in the first uh, splash, that agriculture still is and will be the main water user in the future. But there is a huge increase in the demand for water worldwide, uh, OECD projects that some 20, by 2050 we have 55% increase in demand requirements, but we don't get much more water. We don't get more water, so we need to be more effective in the way that we use water. And her forest and landscape approach comes in, because we should, in our planning approaches, build in the water supply and also the changes in the hydrological cycles that we do see. And I believe that forest finally can provide three main uh, approaches to how to use water and also harness the floods and also be a, a handling the drought areas or drought um, um, sectors, but also contribute to local and regional water supply and finally be the basis for the circular use of water. So it's a very close connection between forestry, landscape approach and water and we do get more water. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to, to my colleague. Thank you, Terry. Um, I would like to thank you for, for uh, your reflections there. Um, I think soon we will hand over f to the audience for, for some input if you have some thoughts on what's being said so far. But before that, I would like to um, ask Evan Girvets from the CGR Research Program for Water, Land and Ecosystems. Uh, I know that you do all kinds of research uh, when it comes to ecosystem services, intensified sustainable agriculture, uh, water management in the landscape. What is your perception? What, is the, uh, what are the challenges? Are there challenges in integrating water resource management? And are there trade-offs between, what are the trade-offs between agriculture and for the more land-based um, activities? Sure, yeah. Uh, thank you for the question and thank you for having this, this great panel today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, for one, uh, I mean, a main issue is that agriculture needs water, is a big user of water, and we think about smallholder farmers in it uh, are very dependent on the ecosystem services that, that are around them. Um, at the same time, agriculture is also driving land use change, um, using water, and affecting how others relate to water. And so I think just that connection there between um, the use of agriculture, the use of water by agriculture, and then also the impact of water, uh, on water and on the landscape by agriculture shows that the landscape of, uh, approach is very important when we're thinking about agriculture and, and how these different uses interact in the landscape. Let me give you a couple of, of, of examples of um, areas where I've worked and where I've seen um, this landscape approach be useful. Uh, one is if I take you to Nairobi, Kenya, where I live, um, there's, 90% of the water for Nairobi comes from one watershed. It's the Upper Tana River watershed. At the same time, 60% of the hydropower for Kenya is coming out of the same watershed. And so there's a real need for that water source to be protected. Uh, but 
there's many smallholder farmers that are, are living up there, um, depend on the water, uh, are, are driving the, the land use, um, and affecting the way that Nairobi is, 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 is receiving its water there. And so something called the Nairobi Water Fund was set up, and this was um, really, I would call it a, a multi-stakeholder platform. Uh, it's really an institution. Uh, the Nature Conservancy was the, the organization that started it, but it brings in many different actors. It brings in um, Nairobi Water that, that receives the water and gives it to, to, to municipal users. Uh, KenGen, which is the hydropower company. East Africa Breweries, which is a major user of water there to turn it into beer. Uh, Coca-Cola, there's many other partners that are, that are there. And what they're doing is putting money into this fund. They're looking to get $15 million in it, and they're, they're on their way there by 2020. That would then invest $1 million per year in different sustainable land management practices in the watershed to promote the provision of, of clean water um, for the downstream users. And so I think that is one example of where it's a multi-stakeholder platform. Um, I think it's, it's thinking fairly big. I mean, 90% of Na Nairobi's water. Um, it's addressing the issues of smallholder farmers there. And, and I think there's, there are challenges, though, still. Um, we think about the adoption of some of these practices by smallholder farmers or by any farming. Um, that's one of the main challenges is if we have the money, that's one thing. But actually getting a farmer to change is a whole other thing that takes uh, a social infrastructure, a community infrastructure to, to promote that. So. Um, I think that's a good example. I, I, I would, um, as some messages to throw out to the, to the group for, for thinking, I think some of these multi-stakeholder platforms are very important to bring together the different actors in this. Um, I think we should be thinking big in that same sense, but at the same time, I think addressing some of the issues that are on the ground in terms of how we can get adoption of these um, important technologies, uh, farming practices, um, that, that both help the smallholder farmers that are there in the landscape, but then also are promoting the clean water downstream. Thanks, Evan. I would like to um, throw out the question to you in the audience. Um, any reflections you have on what's being said so far, and maybe specifically when it comes to the policy and the capacity level arena, what are the, what are the um, uh, pathways of co collaboration here between water and, and land management? And, uh, are there any trade-offs or challenges that we need to, to deal with? Have you got any thoughts about that in the audience or, or you in the, in the panel? Too early? <laughs> well, you think about that a little bit, maybe. What about you, Torgny and, and Peter? Have you been thinking something about the trade-offs between policy and capacity level? On trade-offs, let me start with your question, the most recent question. I believe that what we're experiencing, of course, is the huge uh, urbanization taking place. And the figure that I have got is that only in India, over the next few decades, the number of people moving into being born and raised in cities are more than total US population. And of course, that needs a lot of investment in landscaping, infrastructure, etc. And of course, dealing with water, that is a key factor. And that what is, is what we see. There is a, a great demand, as I mentioned, for water, for cities, of course, also for energy production, manufacturing industry, still agriculture and households. So we do see increasing demand and competition of water resources. So we need to be more efficient in the way and allocate water. And that also goes for landscape planning and also the way that we should have smart incentives how to plan not only water use but also in the landscape and the forestry. So I think issues like uh, being a transparent policy making, making incentives for smallholders and small businesses to grow, and also looking into real estate and also in the property sector. We need to find ways and means to handle uh, uh, scarce resources and finite resources in a much more smarter way in the future. And there is a connection between water and landscaping and forestry. Thank you. Have you got any thoughts on that, Peter? I Just I'm a sure brief one. <laughs> I, I sometimes use a slide uh, where I show a map uh, around uh, Jakarta and, and Bogor. And then I say that the most important forest product in Jakarta is clean drinking water because they are the catchment of outside of Bogor where it rains five meters per year is covered by forests. And of course, that's where the drinking water for Jakarta is harvested and brought to, to people, to the 20 million people or so in Jakarta. And coming back to the SDGs, this is obviously mainly and first and foremost a health benefit. It's not an ecosystem or a forest or a water benefit, it's a health benefit. Thank you. Um, as a follow-up question, I've, I've heard that many times now that the forests are so 
so very important for the for the drinking water in in Jakarta. What about the governance there? Do you do you know what is is are the forests protected there to secure the the water? You know, for one of the reasons to secure uh, water availability, or or are they threatened? Is there any problem there? Yes, is the short answer. I can probably pass that to Terry, who will study it in more detail. But, but yes, of course, there are there there is a lot of in public interest and and uh, in 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 keeping the water catchment intact and uh, balancing the pressure from from other land uses. Yes, of course. Thanks. Over to you, Terry. Something about investments, maybe. Yeah, I think so. Um, let's bring in uh, Christian and and Twee, but from very different perspectives. Twi Sorry. Well, this, this is okay, I think. Um, I think the uh, you, you both come from the financing of, of water initiatives from very different approaches, one from the grassroots and one from the more, um, I guess, higher level perspectives. But w one of the things that has sort of, we've been talking about as part of organizing this, this panel and the general dialogue between Siri and C4 and the whole landscape approach is, is how, to, how do you fi finance these sustainable water initiatives from your different perspectives? So maybe Twee, from the grassroots perspective, you go first, and then Christian you can talk about water you investments. You can ask if you want, but I think scale. we'll forward then to Maria Teresa. But maybe you want to. Yeah. Um, I am happy to be here. It's an honor also to be part of this panel. It's working this. this? Keep it. Okay. Keep it close. Mm. Okay. Uh, you know, we work from the bottom up actually approach. And for us, uh, water has been central uh, to talking uh, after that about uh, landscape approach or talking about adaptation and mitigation to climate change. So water, when we talk in communities about water, that bring everybody together into the table, bring the government, bring the other institution, but mainly bring the people who care about this and bring people from upstream and bring people from down the stream. And it's for many of you, maybe are familiar with the concept of payment for environmental services. We don't do exactly that. We do, uh, the approach for us is reciprocity. And this concept of reciprocity means I do this for you today and you will do this for me tomorrow. So join all the people together. This bring us to four countries with partners actually and involved 125 municipalities. And that has helped us to protect more than a million hectares. And the protection of those million hectares are not based on, on, on just uh, making new protected areas, it's based on protect water sanctuaries. People are doing this protection at the, uh, the municipality level, thinking how they will secure water for, for drinking purposes, but mainly for agriculture. So, uh, but also like, in this million hectare, we have at least a quarter hectare, a quarter million hectare, who are protected based on this concept of reciprocity, and who pay for this in this in these four countries, in these 120 municipalities. Mainly, 70% of this money is coming from local sources. That means municipality, but that means also people like you or me who are paying through the water bill or through the other system to protect their own watershed. So that money is bringing up to farmers up the stream, as he explained before, to change land practices or to protect forests. So this is what we're doing at the local level. So it seems to me, we cannot talk with people about landscape approach because they don't understand that. They don't know what it means, actually. So you cannot talk about adaptation, mitigation to climate change because that's too far for them. But if you talk about water and how to protect water source, people mobilize far easier. And then also, it's like it's not just one example. It's four countries doing this, and many other people actually follow up. And the idea is how to bring this concept of reciprocity, not just to Colombia, not just to Ecuador, not just to Peru and Bolivia, bring to other countries because it's, in, it's possible. We uh, has doing it in many of these cases, and it's, it's growing the concept. From my end. When it gets to landscape level interventions and you compare that to individual projects that might have been done in the past, for example, under the CDM for generating carbon credits or by official development aid to de generate something else, the difference is if as you upscale, you have a lot more different players and you have to pick them up from where they come from. So you will not attract 
a company that wants to ris manage its water risks with carbon credits, and you won't attract a typical official development aid player with uh, some commodity that might not be in his area. So what we did, for example, in a large-scale project in um, East Africa, it basically consists of the distribution, installation, and management of um, water uh, chlorine dispensers that allow for two things. One is that you can get clean drinking water out of unsafe, more or less, sources without having to boil it. And that's the second point. If you don't have to boil it, you don't chop down trees and you have restoration of your natural capital. And the question was, how is that financed? And we uh, lumped together four different, say, motivations. The first one was cl classical ODA. So we, um, there was some grant funding in it, which was focused on WASH, the typical water availability, sanitation, and hygiene goals. But we also put in uh, the carbon market. So there were players that were interested in the non-renewable biomass use reduction in the forests around that area. And then there was a third player coming in, which was um, private sector players that did their water disclosure under the CDP. Uh, actually, just now, a couple of weeks ago, the first ever rating of the water risk management of private companies was done by the CDP with us, where you could actually find out which company is doing a good job or less so good job in managing their water risk, either, phys either physical risk or risks related to the social license to operate. So they could also come in into, into those um, pr types of projects. And finally, um, players around deforestation, free supply chains that want to make sure that they have a source of supply that is still there in 20 years because they don't contribute to loss of landscapes. And uh, one, one commodity that there is quite of interest is cotton. So that it's four different players and it comes at different scales of time. You know, you have grant funding to start up things. Um, you have cotton in the very long term. You have carbon credits in the midterm that contribute to operating a project that might have already started. And that combination went fairly well in this project and also a couple of other projects in South America. Thank you. That seems to be, and that's very good, I think, different kinds of financing for these kind of activities which are so, so badly needed. Um, I was thinking a little bit about the connection between the, the community level funding, which I suppose, you know, it's not that much money, really. I mean, it's just normal people living there. And then the more industry-based funding, which can be much larger. Uh, what would you say, Maria Teresa? What would be the is there a connection between these time types of funding? You know, uh, seemed to us that it's really important that most of the money for uh, landscape restoration, watershed protection, should be coming from local sources because that will be sustainable. So, if people down the stream are convinced that they should protect their own water supplies up the stream. I think it's far better for society that that relies on money for the international cooperation. Uh, saying that, I think uh, it's really important the international money to start up some new process and to speed up those process. So like seeding money at the beginning is really important. And in cases that we are working these four countries, <coughs> between 70 and 80 percent is coming from local sources. Means, uh, and I think people understand that when you create local institutions or you do that based in local institutions that are um, reliable and they can believe that the money that are given to them, they really will be well expended on conservation, on watershed protection. <laughs> so uh, for us, uh, we don't do anything without the support of the local municipality, leading actually the local municipality, but leading also local authorities. And I think that is really important for the future too, because you know, donor money can give a lot of money at the beginning, but they don't want to give it money for 10 years or 20 years. So they, you know, how long is a project? Normally three years, normally five years, and they, uh, that, that means long. But you know, you need to protect those ecosystems for life. So how you do that is creating local strong institution, uh, or at least supporting this local institution there. And I think it's only local people who will be willing to do that if they see themselves living there for a long time. 
So uh, that's, that's my thought about that. So I take it that you say that the, uh, the ODAs or, or project money is very important as a boost, as an initiator, but in the long term, it's really important to find the community funded uh, mechanisms. Yeah. I'm going to let you in, Peter. I just want to check first with Christian. Do you, do you agree? Um, I do. I do. And I think there's two options. One is that you find a way to mix short term and long term returns. Or you only have, well, you have a focus on the long term return and then you find someone that bridges the gap for you. And um, I mean, th in this, in this case, it was fairly obvious in the Malawi, uh, in, in East Africa project, the fuel cost savings were so significant from day one that everyone locally was, was all up for it, you know. And then long terms, there was, in the long term, there was this restoration ecosystem benefit, which, w which takes a while to get there. And if you don't have that obvious short-term benefit, maybe then you can structure your project in a way where you have several <coughs> revenue streams. You might we have the project of a piggery in, in Colombia which wanted didn't have water for their operations. And they wanted to reforest a large-scale piece of land, um, but they thought, so what do I do in the next five years? So they started with bamboo plantations. And then they switched slowly to native tree plantations. And also they talk to the environmental authority because the authority charges for water use and the authority is supposed to restore lands, which they did not. So they actually went to them, guys, we just invented all this money to restore this watershed and please stop sending me your invoices for watershed services paid to you because we did your job. And they actually agreed to stop invoicing them because they showed that the private company restored the watershed themselves. Thank you. Peter, I could see that no, you... Yeah, I just wanted to agree with, with this uh, local decision-making uh, as, as the foundation. Um, but maybe it's more the decision-making than the money, because I think the access to capital from the, uh, in, shall we say, international markets will be increasingly important also for the local people. So it's not that the money only has to come from there. But I think it is indeed true that public, in particular ODA-type investments, will probably play less and less role and have less and less impact for, for these situations. And also, that's my other point, um, that's good because uh, we, we risk f ending up in, in these uh, very simplistic top-down uh, solutions such as cutting down a tree is bad. Cutting down a tree can be very good. In fact, we just heard from the State Secretary that 32% of Sweden's energy is, is bioenergy. So we, we should be a bit wary about the, 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 the solutions that we dictate from, from, uh, uh, from above. I could see that Torgny also. Had yes, thanks. A uh, comment or two on, on the financing. I fully agree that main financing will be domestic, domestic raised funding. But looking at the global picture or the, the financial markets, and I also agree very with Peter that uh, we have seen the peak aid. I mean, there is, will be no more aid in, in, in that there will be aid made, but not, not increase in aid. But there is a market there that is actually possible to tap into. That is the trillions of dollars invested every year in different uh, projects, infrastructure, investments, etc. And there is now a, 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 a <coughs> movement, a quite rapid movement on, on greening those investments. I'm part of a of a, a work that is looking into the green bonds, the climate bonds, where you raise funds on the market and tap into the market by setting up standards for water, energy, etc. And that is a possibility because the money is there. It's the, to di redirect them to be more, more green or more blue, whatever you wish. And that market is huge. I mean, there is a calculation now that the green bond market will be $100 billion by 2020 when the green climate fund will be the same magnitude. And there also, I was in a discussion yesterday with some international financial institutions. They are also lending now for natural capital investments. So there is a movement in the capital market, and that is the future on the global market. But domestic is the main, main source. Thank you. Terry, Can I? what are you saying? May I? <laughs> I'd like to ask a question that's sort of double-sided in, in some ways. Um, uh, two things that we really struggle with uh, with the landscape approach is issues of tenure and rights, and the second is on institutional arrangements. Um, and I'd like to ask the same th that that question to two different people, to Anders and to and to Michelin from from uh, New Zealand. 
um, from New Zealand, you've been working a lot on tenure rights issues, particularly with indigenous peoples, um, access to forests, access to water, etc. Could you give us a, a short introduction to the type of issues that arise when you're working with these uh, indigenous folks? Um, and Anders, you've been working obviously from a research policy uh, perspective, and you have a very broad overview of the institutional arrangements that, that are effective in sort of bridging the gap, if you like, between research and policy and development. Maybe you can give us a, a short summary of, of your perspectives there. I don't know which one of you wants to go first. Thank you, and kia ora everybody. Uh, it's lovely to see you all. Um, yes, we've been working uh, back home, uh, you know, Indigenous peoples, our relationship to our water and our landscapes is a spiritual relationship and it's a everyday informal relationship as well. And uh, the way in which we manage and, and regulate uh, use of our waterways is very much a, includes our customs and uh, our ceremonial areas and what what is the nature of those areas. And we have established uh, community-based monitoring and information systems where our local people uh, monitor according to our traditional knowledge and according to our cultural indicators. Uh, we often will use the traditional uh, calendars, uh, that uh, lunar calendar, that... Uh, you know, it talks about what should be happening, when during the year, uh, what our fish are doing, and we still quite rely on uh, the rivers for drinking water, for teaching our babies to swim, uh, for breaking our horses in. Our part of our, the way that we monitor our, our waterways and our landscapes also includes our, the di diversity of our languages. So um, the fisher folk and, and, and uh, are we still uh, talking in our mother tongue around um, how we describe our waterways and our landscapes? And so this is kind of a new uh, project that we have been establishing under the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. You know, when you have local people gathering information of relevance to them, the question is often how do we aggregate that into a landscape report? How do we aggregate that into a national report? And further into regional and global reports. So these are the types of uh, challenges uh, that we face because often with Western science, it's very um, easy that it can be applied in other areas and tested in other areas. But we're quite positive that because of the common interests of Indigenous peoples and in our relationship to water and landscapes, that we can aggregate and um, we do intend to. And a part of the, what we also monitor is around rights. Um, you know, it's well reported that we're Indigenous peoples uh, have the rights to manage and live out their traditional livelihoods and uh, customary practices, that that is where the high biodiversity spots are around the world. And so we want to empower Indigenous peoples and hear more from them about uh, the way in which uh, we manage our areas and the way in which we have a relationship. And so it is quite timely also that we talk about this, whereas over in the ADP me meeting, we're struggling to have Indigenous peoples' rights included in Article 2. And so we call on all those who can support us to, to ensure that it, it is in there as a Paris outcome. Kia ora. Thank you. Um, no easy questions. Uh, talking about bridging science and practice, I think it's important to, uh, to plant science and evidence-based vision nationally. We, we work a lot with, with capacity development with, with universities bilaterally in, in sub-Saharan Africa, for example. This is an important work. Uh, but, but we will never take the farmers in their hands and help them literally but this must happen from, from national evidence-based visions and, and, and work. Uh, and, and of course, tenure is a problem. Uh, and, and what can we do about it is, is national questions about ownership and so on. But I, I think uh, we, we have, Lotta mentioned uh, uh, seminars that we have. We have been working with, with forest and water and, and 
what do we do know about this in Sweden and how can we enter international society with, with our methods and so on. There is a policy brief outside and a report, please take it. Uh, as our State Secretary mentioned, we have struggled with degraded forest and deforestation 100 and 150 years ago and we managed that and, and we, we did economical growth from that. Now this is not transferable to today's situation, but there are processes, there are analyses to make on how did that happen, uh, what were the stakeholders, how did they interact? And I think uh, th this could, of course, be dwelled upon a lot. And there are other countries, other examples, South Korea, uh, Vietnam, China, where this has happened in different ways. And I think with the landscape approach, you can frame this. But there is no general landscape approach solution. But as Peter says, that there are good tricks that may <coughs> apply in different situations. Uh, one thing that has not been mentioned so much and, and, and if we talk about academy and making uh, evidence-based uh, in, in practice in, in nations, on the lower level, to, to make investments to happen, you need to have also farmers who are ready for this. Uh, one important part in Swedish development and in other countries has been farmer organization, where uh, they get empowered to, to start to know things about development and, and maybe make, make better agriculture for delivering quality and quantity sustainably. And that's when investment can come in. Before that, this cannot happen. So, so and, and there are a number of, of, of these uh, activities. But if I would stress something, I, I would stress national ownership of, of evidence base understanding and and farmer organization, actually. But um, of course, this could be dwelled upon a lot. But I recommend our policy brief out there. <laughs> Thank you, Anders. Thank you for marketing. <laughs> and also for your very, very clever words. Um, uh, I wonder, are there any reflections out here in the, in the audience? What are your, you can start in front here. Please, um, uh, your name. Hello, my name is Daniel Muriarso. I'm with C4. I'm Indonesian. Um, talking about the policy uh, realm uh, regarding forests and water, uh, there was a rule of thumb in Indonesia that uh, regions should have 30% of coverage of forests in order to be able to sustain. And that kind of approach has been nationalized top down and regardless the shape or the terrain kind of uh, challenges they have. So this top down thing create a lot of problem when we are talking about landscape here because uh, district at the um, high elevation should will be, s will be uh, suffering from not developing the land. But those who are in the downstream will, will benefit from what has been sacrificed in, in the upstream. So this kind of situation should, somebody should splash uh, the landscape, <laughs> not too far to the SDG. And uh, maybe this kind of thing need to be uh, triggered by science uh, information that, that needs to be put in the national level, not necessarily to equip uh, the national institution to um, have a kind of top-down approach, but looking at at smaller scale and, and district or whatever level down below, and, and landscape approach should be should help the situation. There's another question over here, Lotta. Can I, can, yeah, can I just uh, just a follow-up question? I'm just interested because that's a very uh, interesting uh, reflection. Is that being done at all in Indonesia? Are you working yet on these issues? I don't want to tell the story why it's 30 percent, and uh, <laughs> regardless the the number or the size, it's been creating a lot of confusion in many ways, including the the, the way water set is managed because you have to involve a number of local government which you know feel uncomfortable with the rule which is nationally implemented. 
Can I go ahead? Yeah, um, Cindy Morris. I'm a researcher here in France at the Fran France's uh, National Agricultural Research Institute for, uh, for Anders Malmer. Could you please uh, talk a little bit more about what you mean by national ownership of evidence-based understanding, given that evidence-based <laughs> understanding is often an international process? Um, could you please explain what you mean by that? Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, you know, th th there's a lot of wonderful research going on at the CGIR Center, and it's definitely an international process. And, and there are uh, mushrooming lots of universities in sub-Saharan Africa. They are not part of this international process because they have bad libraries. They don't have access. Uh, they, they are... Uh, uh, doing a lot of teaching with lots and lots and millions of students and they don't have time for research. They need to, to boost this. They need to take part of the process and, and thereby get the air of their national policy makers. And, and, and maybe some of them even become the national policy makers. And that is still a very poor development in science development as I see it. And Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. But, but I mean, uh, you, you can have a sense of ownership of, of the knowledge. Or it, it can come internationally, top down, but, but you can actually create it in your country from your own university through the, the, the uh, forest agency or whatever to the legislators. That would be more efficient than, than, than it's in, in, in the cloud, basically. Thank you. And Nigel Asquith, Fundacion Natura Bolivia. I'd just like to make the point, pushing back on the, on the idea of top-down science, and that's absolutely critical, but the idea, going back to what Maria Teresa mentioned, of, of bottom-up action, that this has to come from the bottom. If people are going to protect their own watersheds, they're not going to do that with aid. And with tomorrow afternoon, we'll, or tomorrow lunchtime, we're launching an, a new initiative called Water Shared, which is across the four countries. There's a million hectares of, of, of new protected areas created in the last few years, and we're, we're going to be continuing that in the future. Um, and we've got about half a million people across four countries paying directly to protect their own watersheds. And that goes to the upstream people who, who live upstream and, and, and are receiving benefits. And actually, uh, another plug, the upstream people produce things from the benefits they get from these payments. This is a, a jar of honey which upstream people are producing. We're going to give out 80 jars of honey for the first people at our event tomorrow. More, more seriously, though, this is how you link development and conservation and your, your, your adaptation mitigation. So it's got to be the integrated goal. But the way we do it is from top-down science that shows us how to do this properly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think there was a comment more than a question, so I will walk down. And while I'll talk, I will say a, a try to say a reflection by myself. <laughs> I think uh, the, the discussion here, it really shows how... Uh, important it is with the incentives, incentives to actually manage your land uh, sustainably. And that goes back to what Peter said, that you, know, you shouldn't really see always cutting down trees as something bad. Sometimes it's very good, because sometimes if you do it in a good way, that will give people incentive to actually earn some money for themselves and their children and so forth. So it's all about managing, incentives for managing sustainably. <coughs> Thank you very much. This is a great leap. but. Um, a lot of the meta-analysis studies of the tropical deforestation point out that the mega-scale uh, agricultural global fruit supply chains are the major drivers of tropical deforestation, which means that uh, we're looking at ma massive-scale land grabs in Ghana to uh, palm oil plantations, soybean plantations, uh, biofuel plantations in tropical countries, which it seems to me that these uh, micro-scale uh, payment for ecosystem services and landscape kind of approaches are not going to be uh, useful or adequate to tackle because these are like uh, questions of international trade. Uh, so uh, how do you think that the panelists think in terms of like tackling these uh, large scale, mega scale projects that are causing the deforestation? Uh, I'm Asim Zia from University of Vermont. It's actually a really good question. It's, um, it's something that um, I was at a social event yesterday, a social media event yesterday and was asked exactly that. We, we presented the work on some basic landscape frameworks. 
And the question that came from, I think, your very young 17-year-old blogger was, how do you, how do you mitigate the impact of ev everything that happens outside that landscape? And that's so it's very much underlining what you're, what you're asking. So I'm going to turn that over to the panel. I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Does um, Christian? anybody feel they want to answer or can answer? Thank you. I think I'll pick up a citation by the Unilever CSO earlier today. He summed up, and soy and palm together are more money than the whole ODA around the world. And I think where, where it's, it's the driver, but it's also the opportunity, because he also added, and if you guys or anyone can produce this more sustainable, I'm the first to buy it, basically. So, and then the question comes down to, we have a market that there has an existing demand, a large demand, but it has to be cleaned up. So how do we invest into that cleaning up phase? And um, there's one example, it's from textile industries, but I, I quite like it. It's, it's an investment fund called Tau Investment. And what they do is they talk to textile companies like Gap and say, what's your worst problem? And then they say, you know, whatever, uh, bad production standards, uh, non-certified textiles or whatever. And then they go out there and consider investing into not the best performer, but the worst. And then they fix that company up knowing that they already talked to the demand for the most sustainable product. And that's how, how they create value. If they would invest into the best player, they wouldn't raise the value of that company. So I think there's innovative ways out there to transform the two deforestation-free supply chains at scale. Yeah, just to add to that uh, quickly, as I said before, I, mean, I think we need to think big here, and, and, and I do agree with what you're saying. Um, even the watershed example or water fund example that I gave, I think starts to get there, but still not to the scale that you're talking about. Um, we're also doing some work with uh, what's called an agricultural growth corridor, and there have been these spatial development initiatives or these growth corridors throughout the world, and particular, particularly in Africa. This one's in Tanzania called the Southern Agricultural Growth Corridor of Tanzania. And they're looking, it's a, it's a public-private partnership, where they're looking to catalyze external investment in agriculture, but they, they have a a pledge towards smallholder farmer inclusive models and also green growth. And so my point here too is I think a similar story in that th there is an opportunity here that we should be engaging in. And uh, they, they started something called the Green Reference Group in the Southern Agricultural Growth Quarter of Tanzania in the, in the institution. Um, my institution, SIAT, has been involved in that Green Reference Group as other uh, NGOs, as the private sector, as government agencies, as farmer organizations. And so. One thing I think that's nice there is that it provides the platform, um, a, a multi-stakeholder um, platform that is focused on the, the growth in the area, on those even external um, value chains and markets, um, but provides an opportunity to, 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 to take the bring the landscape approach and to address the water issues at that whole corridor scale, which it goes all the way from the Indian Ocean in Tanzania all the way to Zambia across the country. So it's a massive part of the country. So I think there are opportunities out there, but uh, I think a challenge there, again, and, and, and I think somewhat going back to the last comment, is finding those governance structures, those institutions at the national, and then it also has to be subnationally as you get down towards the community and, and, and linked across there where you really can implement um, what needs to be implemented there and be effective and not just have it be talk or greenwashing at a high level. Thank you, Evan. Uh, any other comment on from the panel before we go to the next question? Yeah, Peter? I can't resist this one because for two reasons. First of all, yes, we can discuss the large-scale agriculture as well. And my point is those are landscapes too. It doesn't mean that they're outside uh, the, the kind of approach that we, are, that we are trying to discuss here, that we bring in all the different stakeholders, all the different objectives and try to find good solutions. That applies to the, those situations too. So it's not that it's outside. That, that's the first point. And the, and the other point, and this is of course always difficult to discuss, but um, it's good for someone. It's good for something. Otherwise, it wouldn't happen. And it's good for income. It's good for jobs. It's good for exports. It's good for trade. So part of working. What, what I like a, a lot with thinking at the landscape level is that you, you, you are in a way forced to look at things from the other side too. And, and, and then realize that, ooh, that there might be others that think this is actually good for other reasons. And then you can start discussing the good solutions. 
By that, I don't defend uh, deforestation or, or expansion of palm oil plantations on peatlands or anything. I'm just saying that th th there are always some more views to take into consideration. Okay, thank you. So let's move on, Terry. Should we go on with Christian? Sorry. Should we go on? Yeah. Great, thanks a lot. Um, I got a question to uh, Maria Tessa um, about um, r r uh, river management. Um, I really like the idea of um, empowering the people uh, to uh, resolve their own problems. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, you were saying that you are not in need of money, but um, are there other needs like uh, knowledge or coaching to, to in initiatives? Uh, to, to let initiatives grow? Uh, and I want to respond to him too, uh, because he made a comment about that. It's not that we don't need money. It's just we have to, uh, you know, uh, and we are talking all the time about these global funds that one day will may trip, triple down and get into, the, into our countries and it will change what we are doing with our resources. And you know, I don't see that coming that often, actually. And have been working 20 years in this field, and it's really like it takes so long actually to get money for the central government or for the international cooperation. So, meanwhile, you have faced deforestation every single day in these rural communities. So, what they say is. We need, of course, this money. It will be nice if we we'll have it, actually. And uh, we, we can push uh, quite uh, quickly, maybe, with the change that we want it to be done in those areas. But the fact is that uh, that takes a long time. Uh, most of the money is lost in, in the bureaucracy, actually, or in, or in other issues, actually. It doesn't arrive really to the community, to the change that you want to do there. So, uh, and also, I think that money is really useful uh, when you see the whole picture, in what part of that picture it is useful, that money, and I think it's to start off the uh, maybe to move in, in, into this approach that we are building in the local level. So uh, I'm sure uh, the communities need uh, other help too, like uh, I think organizing and recognizing then how to take solution between people up the street and down the street is really useful there. and. Having more information about how waters are how forests are connected to water are really important too, and that is knowledge. Normally, you can perceive that, but you don't have normally the data. You don't collect data to figure out if you protect one hectare of water, how much uh, or, or forest, how much water you have, and that takes long time. And as it's no local money to do that type of research, so if somebody can bring those data together, make more sense actually what they are doing uh, across the protection in those areas. Thank you. I think there were some, yes, there were some hands down here. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Felix Aponte Gonzalez. I come from the Environmental Ministry of Puerto Rico. And I, was, I wanted to, to ask the, the whole panel uh, in terms of if they know experiences or their perspectives of using landscape restoration to ameliorate or to deal with drought issues, to, to reduce drought impacts, and to see if they know of some experiences that in other places that they've used that to, to reduce the, the drought impacts in, in several areas, and to get to know a little bit more about that. Uh, yes. Now, the <coughs> it being a, a, a trained forest ecologist, I would say, Trees are the best ways to restore land uh, because they, they bring more organic matter to the soils. Now, there, there has been a decades of debates about what tree does, if they use water or if they improve groundwater recharge, for example. Uh, uh, this research is, is actually improving a lot. And, and we know more, and I like the, the introductory film here, which, which touched upon this. And, and, and what is developing is our better understanding of groundwater recharge, for example. And, and there may be trade-offs between groundwater recharge and transpiration. And organic matter also in, in, in 
improves water storage during droughts and so on. Uh, today we talk more about, not about should there be a forest or not for this trade-off, but we try to work with optimal tree densities. In landscapes in semi-arid areas, for example, you probably should not have landscape covering forest plantations, but rather agroforestry, woodlots, and so on. The trees should be there, but how much, and so on. Um, in, in this case, I, I would also <laughs> promote another policy brief, <laughs> a really good one. It's also <coughs> out here in the table. Uh, tomorrow, in booth 29, there will be a one-hour launch of this one, which actually, I mean, technically, this is a bit complicated, but there are many aspects that are very important here, and this is the best one bringing this together so far, I think. Big, big way for that policy brief also. Any other comment on this issue from the panel before we move? I'm going to move down there afterwards. Yeah. Any other com comments from the panel? No. Full, full answer. So you've been waiting a lot, long time down here. So I'm moving down. Who was, who was waving? I think. Hi, <coughs> hi, uh, Douglas Varshall, Radio Free Asia. Uh, I was kind of hoping to get a bit more of a splash on these SDGs. Uh, how do, do, do they work for you guys? I mean, do you integrate them in this whole landscape thing? Uh, any reflection on that? We've been here for an hour and nobody's brought them up. <laughs> and that's kind of why I came to this panel. So, any, any ideas? Are they important? I mean, are you integrating them into your landscape approaches? I mean, I'm curious, I'm a serious question, I think. Uh, I can start. It's not that I'm into landscaping, but uh, on overall, just uh, right now, they were endorsed two months ago. Right now, there is a work do being done by the UN Statistics to provide indicators how to measure, how to follow them up. That is a good starting point. But what I mentioned earlier on is that we cannot end up with having 17 different tools and 17 different streams. We need to find a connection in between them and think that is for me and for us dealing on water the main trick as we look into the water goal, which is a great one, but we also realize that water, or a number of other goals are dependent on water. I mean, hunger, food, uh, et cetera, energy, et cetera. So I think that to me is the most important, not to end up l looking only at the specific goals, but to find means and ways to integrate them. I think that is part of the question. And I think that is all up to all of us to find that in the future, that that will make the world a better place, not doing it one by one. Can I? Um, I'll take on Anders' model here and, and promote something. <laughs> this is a this is a one page on Seafor's new strategy, and it explains how our seven work areas connect to the seventeen SDGs, and that that's really the framework and the basis for our work going forward. And it is also in my uh, in, in my book, this is actually what the landscape approach is too. It is about figuring out how do we weigh the different possible. Uh, results in uh, along ac across a wide range of goals. It doesn't have to be these 17, but for any landscape, you will have a number of priorities and a number of different goals from different stakeholders. How do you how do you weigh them together? How do you integrate them? That is the, la the, the landscape approach, and and, and uh, we have one uh, publication recently where we tried to n uh, narrow this down to four measurables. One is income. One is uh, one is resilience, which can be stated as biomass in the landscape. One is resource efficiency, which can be expressed as how much greenhouse gas, how much energy are we using per produced unit. And one is uh, the level of uh, output in terms of food from, from the landscape. Just to, to kind of start the, di the dialogue around what are the important results and outcomes and how, how do we weigh them against each, each other. This is the landscape approach to me. I'm very curious. I would like to direct the question to Tui, if I, if I may. From the community and the indigenous perspective, how important is it to integrate these things in, in, in the landscape management from, from your perspective? Uh, yes, thank you. I, uh, we've been, as I said earlier, uh, utilising community-based monitoring and information systems to report against the strategic plan and IG targets under the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. 
And some of our uh, indigenous uh, collective who are working on this globally are also uh, working in the SDGs and uh, the indicators. And we're hoping that we can harmonise across all the uh, reporting and measuring that we're doing uh, across all of these conventions and these goals. Uh, so currently, uh, under the CBD, we measure uh, traditional occupations in relation to biodiversity. Uh, we measure diversity of languages. Uh, we measure uh, land tenure and also how Indigenous communities are included in national uh, biodiversity plans. And these were agreed by the full parties of the convention, over 100 parties. So we're hoping to get similar um, indicators under the SDGs, although we did find that they didn't quite reach um, our aspirations for goals. And also keeping in mind, we continue to monitor and bring out reports and, every, and yet things are not improving. And so we also have to focus on collective action and how we can encourage particularly communities to carry out collective action in response to what we're finding. And at the moment, uh, there is interest from countries such as Guatemala and Bolivia about how do we measure the uh, value that collective action can bring in terms of uh, including around enhancement of our forests and enhancement of our landscapes. Thank you. Yep, may I? Um, while we're shamelessly promoting uh, uh, our own products, uh, I was uh, glad that the gentleman at the back there brought up the issue of the SDGs. Um, tomorrow when the C4 sta <coughs> stand is up, there's a new info brief um, building on what Peter's saying. Uh, linking each of the sustainable development goals with the landscape approach and how a landscape approach is applicable to each of the goals. And that was through an analysis of each of the indicators, all 169 indicators. And that will be available in print at the C4 stand tomorrow. It's also available online on the C4 website. Um, and uh, it builds on what Peter's just showed there, um, <coughs> the new strategy, which is focusing on the, on the goals. Um, but there was a, a lady here who had, a, who's been, had her hand up for quite a while um, okay. in terms of your question. Hello, I'm Anna from the International Forestry Students Association, and I would like to reframe a question about ecosystem services that was already asked, but I would like the panel to reflect um, with a much longer temporal frame. Um, how might a landscape approach to water management, how might that look like in 2050 with 2.5 degree uh, increase in temperature, with significant shifts in hyd hydrological regimes, um, Will a soft approach of ecosystem services be enough? And I'd really like to reflect on the needs of agriculture. Okay, that's a, that's a question for you. <laughs> Evan, you want to start? Uh, yeah, sure. yeah I, can, I can start. And um, Certainly there are many challenges in the future. Um, I would also add population growth to that as far as what the, the future would, would look like. And, um, I, I, I think we need a combination of approaches would be my, my answer, that I think ecosystem services um, is something that's important to be part of uh, the, the portfolio of approaches that we use looking into the future. And I think it's, it's also a case-by-case case, um, you know, thing that, that, that you have to look at, that in some cases I think it can be stronger on the ecosystem service side, uh, ecosystem-based adaptation to climate change and using those kind of strategies. I think on others, um, it, it's gonna have to be more of, of you know, as people say, maybe more of a gray approach of if you need to build more dams or if you need to um, improve your water infrastructure in different ways. Um, but in general, I would tend to say that hybrid approaches is what, is what you know, my, my sense is, is that it's about combining some of these green approaches to climate adaptation, to um, improving ecosystem services, um, the governance of them, the, the, the institutional structures behind them. Um, but at the same time, it's looking at when will we need to be building a higher, um, you know, if it's a, a, a dam or a new dam um, or some sort of flood control management. Um, also, in terms of agriculture, I think there's a lot that, that can be done on farm. I think there's a lot of improvement in management that, that can be done. 
um, and, and whether you call it an ecosystem approach or a landscape approach, I think you know, sustainable land management combined with um, other you know, fertilizer use, um, improved seed varieties, um, irrigation where it's appropriate and, and can be used, I think all these things need to go together um, while still looking at, at the role that ecosystem services plays in doing that. Thank you. Any other comments on the question? On this? <laughs> I, I, it's another I, policy brief. I, I don't <laughs> know if I can contribute here, but I, I, I sincerely like that this question comes from the forestry students. Uh, when, I, when I have my students at home, I tell them, you will, you will still be active working in 2050. The world will change a lot. Imagine the changes. Sometimes I think we do not imagine them. And, and uh, just underlining the, uh, your, your story here that sometimes it will work, sometimes it will not work but we will try to do the best. And it's many cases, there are more than 50 countries south of Sub-Saharan Africa, there are many solutions, and it has to be a mix all the time. And, and also Peter stressing this, uh, finding the best solution and, and <coughs> sort of being able to, to juggle around with solutions and, and with, with values has to be done a lot. Thank you. Terry, do we have time for a short question? I think so. If, okay. if, the, if the panelists could keep it to two to three sentences each. Okay, so if you have a short question, and you can answer shortly. Yeah. Hi, my name is Camila Clausen. I'm the founder of a local NGO in Peru working uh, at Climate Smart Agriculture with communities in the Andes. And my, my question goes to the research debate, and it's about how uh, the, the importance of producing scientific knowledge so we can scale up these initiatives at the policymaking um, level. So my, my question is that, is there any capacity building uh, initiatives from uh, your universities? And I would like Evan as well to compliment uh, uh, with uh, local universities in other regions such as Latin America. So is there an exchange on capacity building going on? Um, well, here maybe I'll start. I can get that microphone. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah there are actually my, my organization, CIAD, is based in Cali, Colombia, and we do a lot of work throughout Latin America, in, in Peru in particular, just opening an office in Lima. And uh, we definitely, uh, collaborate with universities uh, in Latin America, and then I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. We work with universities throughout, so it would be great. Um, I'll get you a flyer <laughs> afterwards <laughs> for the work that we do, and would love to continue the discussion. Yeah, we, we, we traditionally we don't have so much from Sweden in Latin America. We have been a lot in Central America, uh, mainly Sub-Saharan Africa today, also Asia. Uh, and, and this is very important, but I, I think this, with, with ODA and support and capacity development, it has to change. There is economical growth in Africa today. They need to invest in their own universities, and, and there is a delicate balance how much development we do with them and how much they take this in their own hands also. Sorry, just... Uh Wanted to add there, uh, uh, where in terms of the use of traditional knowledge, we understand that uh, it's hard to access, you know, uh, from the communities. Um, however, there is often interest in that, and how can we share knowledge appropriately across borders? Uh, how can we ensure the full respect, uh, promotion, and uh, protection of traditional knowledge in these types of uh, research? Um, and we are quite often interested in partnering with universities and others to do uh, research together. So one initiative that we have began uh, at the global level is to establish uh, traditional knowledge centres of excellence uh, re at the regional level. So that when people are interested, say for example, in, in um, information coming out of the Pacific that may be of uh, relevance to... Uh, the topics and they can come to our Pacific Regional uh, Traditional Knowledge Centre of Excellence and we can uh, connect, you know, connect and assist 
uh, researchers and working together and collaborating uh, to improve the uptake of and respect for traditional knowledge. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Tui. Terry, I think we're running out of time. We are. We are. I think we have time for one last intervention, if I may. Um, the, the slogan of the GLF, the Global Landscapes Forum this year, is it's all connected. And those of you who were in the plenary this morning would have seen a very nice infographic of different um, illustrations of how the world's food, um, environmental, human, livelihood systems are all connected in some way. And I'd just like to go along the panel um, and get, maybe get a one to two sentence response on what are the next steps in increasing that connectivity? Would silos still remain? Um, this is the first time I think that we've had a, a sort of forestry, water, um, real formal interaction besides the World Water Week earlier this year, um, which seems to me amazing considering we're in the 21st century and, and we are all connected. It is a bit. <laughs> so what are the next steps in, in, in fostering better connectivity, better dialogue? I mean, the backgrounds and experiences of the panel alone shows there is that connectivity and um, we need to, to move further down the roads to, to promote that. One or two sentences per, per panelist, if you could sort of summarize, where, what, what are the next steps? How do we move further down that road of connectivity? Two sentences. Start at the local level, look at benefit sharing, how we combine, can combine our forces to find out, not on the input side of the output, what do we could uh, earn together. I think that is what we do in the water sector. We should do it also with forestry. Thank you. Uh, two things. One is to bring in the non-monetary um, <coughs> values into the, into the decision making in a, in a serious way. And the other is to see the climate change mitigation efforts as a co-benefit to landscape development. Uh, and not the other way around. <laughs> I think uh, for us is making clear what are the incentives or where you want to put those incentives. And I think uh, people at the local level will respond if you have the right incentive. And then I think also recognize it from the top down that you have institution bottom up and how to boost those institutions actually to make ch the changes. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, strong multi-sectoral platforms and collaborations that link from the, the local level but also reach up higher to have the, the greater impact. Um, as well as us linking across different sectors and I think of the restoration agenda with the 20 by 20 initiative in Latin America with the now being announced 100 million uh, acre initiative in <coughs> Africa that's been announced and then linking that to the climate smart agriculture efforts that are going on around there and thinking across all these and how the synergies are between those. I'd like to just support um, what others have said and, uh, and I reflect that in our language back home, our, our Māori uh, language, a forest word is ngāhere, and ngāhere means the binding together of all things and um, the connectivity between all things within the forest. And I think that's going to be the way that we achieve the goals is uh, taking an integrated, holistic approach and trusting one another and building partnerships. Kia ora. Uh, for a good marriage, you need partners that are content with themselves, are safe and, and sound in their own body and mind. Uh, taking this to science, when we train our postgraduates today, they really need to be very good in their own silo, in their discipline, <coughs> to be able to have respect also for, for other science. and. Yes, they could be trained also in environments where, where you work at a bigger issue and, 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 and so on, but it's disciplinary and respect of other disciplines and, and to fostering uh, cooperation, multidisciplinary. Um, SDGs, the Paris Agreement, if there's any, um, the deforestation free supply chain pledges, they all give you general guidance but they don't solve the problem. So design your landscape intervention in a way that's flexible enough so that you get everyone on board with the specific goals, but then again, specific enough so it's actually investable. Thank you. Thank you. So Lotta, any last wise words from you? Well, maybe uh, some words of happiness and gratitude could be. <laughs> 
easier than wise, maybe. Um, no, but I am very happy. I'm very happy for the panel. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Uh, I'm very happy that we have a full room. I'm sorry that we couldn't have a larger room. We would have even more people. But I'm very happy that you've been here and that you've been so active and interested. And I'm, I'm very happy that we could do this. So I would like to thank you so much, C4, for, for, for uh, co-hosting this with us and making it, it possible. I think, uh, I think this seminar was a, a good continuation of uh, what we've been discussing before. And uh, to me, it seems like we should go on discussing these things together. So that's the that's next step for me. Over to you, Terry. Um, I'd just like to reiterate um, exactly what you're saying. Fabulous panel. Thanks to all of you for, for coming. Thank you for being a joint uh, co-moderator. And uh, thank you to Secretary Bachterman for providing a very nice uh, opening keynote. And thanks for all of your questions and interventions. Um, there was one last soundbite I wanted to leave, leave you with. We talked about landscape approaches. and, and um, we, uh, we wrote um, something in a presentation which recently which caused a little bit of controversy that a landscape approach is not a project. It's a much more long-term process. And I think if we start thinking about landscape approaches as processes and not projects which are confined by two to three year um, funding cycles and very complex um, lo project, project logical log frames, see that's how complicated they are, They're difficult to say. That we, that we can start appreciating the long-term and dynamic nature of these landscape approaches, which are integrated with water, health, and, and every, everything else. So thank you very much, all of you. Thank you.